We're here at the IFAS Polk County Extension Office where we're going to learn about Florida friendly landscaping, how to do it, and what plants to use. So sit back, relax, and join me on this science quest. Hi Ann, how are you doing? Good. I'm here with Ann Yasalanis. She is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Coordinator for IFAS. Now, Ann, we're in this really great place here. Um, we've got a lot of different examples of some good Florida Friendly Landscaping. But before we get into that, just kind of tell me what, what is IFAS? What do they do here in Polk County? Um, IFAS is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences um, at the University of Florida and every county in the state has an extension service. Here in Polk County, the extension service is in Bartow, and the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is a, a program in cooperation with the county and the University of Florida to teach Florida Friendly Landscaping principles to the residents of the county. Okay, now this service that, that you guys do here is not just for, like you said, it, I mean, it's, it's for the residents of Polk County, mm -hmm. right? And when it comes to Florida friendly landscaping, um, you know, who, who is this for? Like what, who can actually implement Florida friendly landscaping? Well, we teach um, the principles to basically anyone that will listen from school age kids to homeowners to businesses wanting to change out landscaping to community developers, um, construction companies building new homes. Anyone can, can work with Florida friendly landscaping. Now, just to dispel some uh, some preconceived ideas here, I'm looking around, and you know, a lot of people think of Florida-friendly landscaping, and they think, oh, well, you know, it's just a bunch of weeds, and it's you know, it's dry, and it's just kind of rough, and and it's just natural, and it looks very unmanicured. But that's really not the case as I look around here. No, and the important thing to rem remember here is this is a demonstration garden. So here we're trying to to show lots of different things. Um, for a homeowner putting in a landscape, the important thing to remember is the principles. It's not about how it looks, it's how you use the principles and maintenance. Right, mm -hmm. right. because, you know, and, and there's been a lot of talk lately about uh, Florida's natural resources and, and especially with our water issues that Florida has. And Florida Friendly Landscaping is really a great way to take uh, an initial step on helping to solve that problem. Yeah, definitely. By choosing the right plants and putting them in the right place, you can certainly reduce water use, fertilizer, pesticide use, and the great thing is you also reduce the amount of maintenance, so you're yeah. saving time, too. Everybody loves reducing maintenance. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of really great things right around here. Let's just kind of take a look, and you can show me some of the, uh, some of the plants and some of the special things about them. How's okay, that sound? sounds great. All right. Now, I see some really beautiful uh, yellow flowers here. What are these? Mm -hmm. These are a native wildflower. Uh, this is a rosin weed, and this is a native star. You can see with the wildflowers, some of them tend to spread a little bit, right. and you have an extreme, I guess, difference here with a formal shrub and a native wildflower. Well, I notice they're pretty long, and it looks like they kind of lay over mm -hmm. then. That, mm -hmm. Can you trim those back and, and mm -hmm. keep them down to a shorter so they stay upright? You can, and you can see how they spread, and you can cut them off, and they'll be continuous bloomers all summer. Very good. Mm -hmm. Now, Ann, I also see some uh, some lower-lying shrubs here. They almost look like little bonsai trees. What What is this? Um, that's a juniper ground cover. Um, really drought tolerant, uh, ev another evergreen shrub. So again, the people that like the green all mm -hmm. year round, that's a great example of a good, very drought tolerant uh, ground cover. Mm -hmm. And you can see we actually have it growing along a walkway, which is typically how people use a ground right. cover like that. Um, but the nice example we have here is we have it spaced far enough away from the walkway so that you're not continually pruning it okay, off of so the walkway. so it can grow a little bit before mm -hmm. you have to do any maintenance yeah. to it. Yeah, we kind of uh, tend to landscape along a walkway, driveway, something like that with the low near the walkway and then you can kind of stack it up as you go away. So again, you want that visual, you want be able, people to be able to walk through easily. And again, as far as maintenance, we've spaced everything appropriately. Right, right. Well, I see a lot of other great things around here. Let's go take a look at some other stuff. Okay. Now, Ann, this is kind of interesting here, this little yellow flower. What's, what do we got there? 
Uh, this is a milkweed, and we have a couple different varieties of milkweed here. This is a larval plant for the, the monarch caterpillar. What's that mean? So plant. what just... will happen here is he'll, he'll eat all of the leaves on this, this plant. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm seeing, like the little holes and stuff. Right. That comes from larvae eating. Oh, and actually there's a little, a little guy right there. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, and the larvae plants are, are good combined with the nectar plants, obviously. Um, but the thing to notice, you notice all the holes in it, mm -hmm. so probably not the best plant to put right in front of your front door. Right. So if you want some of these uh, butterfly attracting plants where the larvae will eat everything, put them in maybe a more confined Towards area. The back or mm -hmm. okay. Right, right. Once they've turned into butterflies, do they kind of stick around these plants then? Um, this caterpillar will actually eat all of the leaves and then move off of this plant to form the chrysalis. When they emerge from the chrysalis, they'll move on to a different plant for nectar. Is that what you were pointing kind of over here? Is that what this is? Yeah, th these are pentas and um, this would be a good source of nectar for, for a butterfly. And nectar plants aren't um, butterfly specific, so you could have a lot of flowers in your yard and attract the adult butterflies with okay. those. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, when somebody's thinking about planting a, a butterfly garden, I see this kind of really bushes out. That's probably a major consideration then, huh? Right. Certainly, when you buy these in their little one-gallon pot at the store, yeah, it looks you so don't... cute. Yeah, I've seen yeah. these around. They look really nice. And... Yeah, yeah, that's important. We always suggest with Florida Friendly Landscaping that you know how big that plant's going to actually get. So this is a great example of your one gallon little cute guy. And that's why we have you guys here to tell us all this stuff. <laughs> right, that's what we're for, yep. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's move on to another plant here. Great. So, Ann, we talked a little bit earlier about um, irrigation, and here we've got a really good example of your micro irrigation. Tell me a little bit about how this tiny little thing works. Um, what we have here is a micro sprayer, and you can see this is the spray emitter here on the top. And the cool thing about micro sprayers is they're down low, and so they're watering the plant right at the roots where they need it. And instead of watering like a traditional sprinkler mm -hmm. in gallons per minute, this is actually gallons per hour. So it's a great way to conserve wow. water. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're when you're spreading out the water over, you know, minimizing the water like that. Is it important to have things like, you know, I see around here, you can see this leaf bed, um, mulch, things like that. I mean, is that an important factor or with these, does it not really matter as much? Well, with the mulch, we recommend whatever type of mulch you use, that it's um, two to three inches thick. So here, this is just, you know, oak leaves. Right. Um, so the water doesn't have any problem penetrating it. And in fact, some of the micro sprayers go right underneath the mulch. So you would spread your mulch on top of it. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Would that be kind of like those uh, soak? Is is the soaker hose a, a type of micro sprayer, or is yeah. that something different? Yeah, I see those around. yeah, drip tubing or soaker hoses could go right under the mulch. Yep. Very cool. Now, when it comes to conserving water with with uh, with a micro sprayer or mm -hmm. with a micro system, really, obviously you're saving water, you're saving your electric bill, but What's the kind of expense of putting something like this in as opposed to your traditional sprinkler system? Um, these micro sprayers are actually pretty cheap and easy for a homeowner to do. You can buy small kits and stick them up outside on a hose bib, mm -hmm. or you can hook them right into your automatic sprinkler system. So pretty inexpensive, and actually. I, and I noticed it just has like a skinny tube, you know, just a very small tube. So. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're digging a bunch of trenches in your yard or anything like that. No, and again, it goes right under the mulch, so you mm -hmm. can clear out the mulch and lay it down. And very cool. Um, yeah, it's great. Seems like seems like not only a smart and efficient way to water your plants, but an easy way too. Yeah, it's very easy. Very cool. All right. Now here's an example of a great shade tolerant ground cover. This okay. is Mondo grass. You can see it looks like grass and yeah. it grows in an area where you typically wouldn't have turf grass growing. So with this grass, I see it's like, I mean, it's, it's long. Do you have to trim it like you would regular grass? Do you have to mow it occasionally or? No, this actually grows like this. This has been in here for quite a number of years now and it, this is just what it does on its own. So 
low maintenance, which is great. And again, when we when we tie everything into like we talked about earlier with the with the water issue that Florida has, I would imagine a nice thick ground cover like this helps mm -hmm. the water to absorb in rather than evaporate out. Yeah, and actually this area doesn't even get irrigation anymore. So a lot of the plants that we have, we irrigate for establishment mm -hmm. and then everything gets turned off. And that's the beauty of Florida Friendly Landscaping is mm -hmm. that you can plant something and then walk away from it once it's established. Yeah, as far as watering is concerned, there are many things you don't have to water after they're established. Yep. Very good, mm -hmm. very good. Oh, I like these and these are, these seem to be a lot more colorful. Yeah, this is our uh, tropical bed here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've got all the bright colors, the tropical leaves that people this, I think of Florida. This purple one here is interesting. What is this? This is Purple Queen. This is a ground cover that you see around a lot. Um, the important thing to remember with some of these sprawling ground covers is they do require a little bit of pruning. Okay, yeah, I see the, the tops are kind of mm -hmm. snipped off on some of them. So just the ones that get really tall, you just come by mm -hmm. and snip them off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. Um, you know, Obviously the hibiscus, we see those around all the time. Um, what are, what's this orange one here? Lots um, of color coming off of that. Yeah, that's a croton and they're pretty common, super drought tolerant, really tough. And you can see the foliage is kind of curly and really colorful. Yeah. There's a lot of different types of foliage of the crotons. So some of them have big leaves, some are smaller, some are curly. Um, real tough for hot summers. I also noticed with these, with these plants, um, it's very, it's very distinctive. There's, the leaves come to a certain point and then you have them kind of push back. Why is that? Um, yeah, we, we teach that obviously you should have your two to three inches of mulch in all your planting beds, but that the mulch should never be piled up or touching the base of any plant. So we've kind of taught people to pull the, ba the, the mulch away from the base of the plants, um, simply to reduce disease, fungus, rot, um, and then also circling roots that could cause the decline of plants. Now, when people think of Florida-friendly landscaping, they're not really thinking of these type of exotic plants, are they? Right, a lot of times people think Florida-friendly and they get that idea of natural and only native plants, but Florida-friendly is native and exotic plants as long as they're not invasive plants. And now, that's what's, important to what's the different, what does that, what's the difference between native and invasive? What do you, what do you mean when you say that? Um, a native plant is, they, they say, was here prior to Europeans coming to Florida, and that's how natives are classified here. Um, the invasives are plants that are categorized on um, the state list of invasive plants, and the problem with those is not that they invade your yard per se, but that birds and things take their seeds to our natural areas, these plants come up and crowd out our native plants. Oh, I got you. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like uh, those plants are strangling out the native plants. Yep, then. exactly. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Very good, very good. All right. Here's a good example of one of our good shade and sun plants is Kunti cycad. Um, we have a lot of plants that will grow in full sun or full shade, but Kunti, along with our holly we talked about earlier, will grow both, which is great. Yeah. And I can see down here it's got like very stick-like roots to it. And that's, I mean, from what I understand, that's kind of one of the ways to tell if it's a hardy mm -hmm. plant that's going to survive in the sun. Yeah, it's a great, great versatile plant, evergreen. It's a prehistoric plant, real old, so you know it's a good it one. It has a good bush to it, too, you know, it really kind of fills in a lot. Mm -hmm. And speaking of filling in, you've got some like taller grasses here too, kind of like the grass that we saw earlier, but much larger. What mm -hmm. are those? Um, that's a, a liriope, does really well in the shade. Sometimes you see it in the sun as well, but shade is where it likes to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So most all of these plants that we're looking at are shade plants. They are. With this, the exception of the kunti, which could be sun or shade. Correct. Yeah. This is our very shady front of our building. Um, we have a lot of different textures and layers mm -hmm. and a little bit of variegation and that's the white and the green on the leaves of, of these bromeliads here. Um, so we get a little bit of color So you've that actually way. got, that looks like the same plant without the variegation over there by the tree, right? Right, and that's the cool thing about bromeliads. Really, really drought tolerant. In fact, we've had people find these on the side of the road and stick them in the ground and mm. they grow, so you know they're tough. And I've even seen some of these uh, in, in one of your other beds, I saw something like this with like red in it. 
Mm -hmm. like a red bromeliad. There are there the variegated, the light green, purple, red, all all different varieties. So a lot of things to choose from for homeowners. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And then further in the distance, I see something that kind of stands out a little bit more because you've got a lot of really like vibrant green, mm -hmm. but then I see a palm in the back that's not as, what is that? Um, that's a, a native saw palmetto, which is a great plant for anybody to put in their landscape. Uh, saw palmetto is critical to 52 different native uh, Florida wildlife species, um, and they end wow. up bulldozing a lot of them, so we encourage people to put them in their landscapes. This is the stuff that you would find out in the scrub or whatever? Yes. Yeah, but this is a silver variety, so a little bit of interest okay. for a homeowner. Yeah, that's why it kind of stands right. out, because it's yep. got a much lighter color. Yeah, and it po definitely pops in the, the shade garden. Very nice. And then, of course, I see throughout here you have uh, some other types of sprinklers and irrigation and things like that. Right, and we have a variety of sprinklers throughout our demonstration gardens, um, but really are trying to switch everything over to micro, and that's what we suggest homeowners to do as well. All right, excellent. Great. Here's one of our nice potted plants. We have quite a few different potted plants around um, the demonstration garden here, and they are all watered with micro irrigation. Um, so that's a great way to, to right. show that homeowners can easily maintain a container. Well, I know like at my house, I have very, very sandy soil, mm -hmm. which I'm sure a lot of folks here in Central Florida have. Right. This is a great option, I would think, to kind of combat that sandy soil where you have a hard time getting things to grow, mm -hmm. put it in a pot. Yeah, any tricky areas, um, areas maybe where you don't have a lot of space to grow plants, patios. Um, if you have micro irrigation in them, it makes it a lot easier to maintain than trying to remember to right. hand water or anything. Yeah. Now, what is it that we're looking at here? This is a really, really interesting plant. I don't think I've ever seen something like this before. <laughs> this is a pencil cactus. It's a euphorbia, and actually the sap is quite poisonous, but um, good thing to point out is there's so a lot of plants that are poisonous. Don't eat it. Right? No, okay. no, don't eat it. I wouldn't lick it. I don't know. Um, but many of our landscapes plants are poisonous or toxic and um, certainly it's nice to try and keep all of those out of your landscape but I think it's more important that you're mindful of yeah. the fact that they're out there. Very good. A lot of different options around here. A lot of great stuff to look at. Yeah. This is our color garden where we have a lot of examples of um, colorful perennials for Florida. Okay. Um, impatiens, a lot of people are very familiar with those. These are the ones that you'll see at Lowe's in the little cartons that, right. you know, you got your individuals. Right, but another plant that gets a lot bigger than the little, the little one you purchase. Mm -hmm. So we have our impatiens, multiple colors of those. And then here we have another of our native wildflowers. This is blanket flower. Okay. Um, and you see this on roadways. Um, this is really pretty. Yeah, and this is a very, very tough perennial for very, very sandy soils, very dry, hot areas. It will bloom like this all summer long. Very cool. And even when it's not blooming, it's got this interesting little ball here. Like, what is what is the deal with that? Or is that after it's bloomed? Yeah, this is when it's spent and that you'll get the seeds in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. it drops its petals and that's what's left. Right, and you can actually see in here we have a, a a different variety. Um, this is kind of how you normally find it, but you mm -hmm. can see there's a, the more roughly leaf solid uh, burgundy. Sometimes there's a solid yellow, solid orange, so you get a little bit of variation with those. And these are a great way to add color to what would be, I'm guessing, the south side of your house, right? The, the side that's going to see the most sun. Um, you could use it anywhere that it's sunny because these okay. are blooming all summer long. Uh, they will die back in the wintertime, as will some of the, the native wildflowers. All right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I noticed over here we've got some pretty interesting uh, little sh kind of shrubs. What's what's this thing right here? Um, this is a, a variegated oyster plant, and these will do sun or shade. You can see the, the purple under the leaves yeah, that's, there. That's really, that's really cool. Really pops in the landscape, and it stays in that nice little compact shape, which is great. So you can just kind of use these to just kind of throw a little burst of color right. here and there. Right, yeah. Yeah, and you can see how we've, again, spacing is very important with all types of plants, you know, encouraging people to mm -hmm. know the mature size of the plant right. um, and space it appropriately. This is another really great plant in our color garden. This is bulbine. Um, you can see the flowers there, the 
little yellow orange flowers. Yeah, that's neat. The the center is like a little puff. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Yeah, these are very drought tolerant. In fact, if you feel the leaves, they're like a succulent. They're kind of thick and fleshy. Yeah. Um, they're from Africa as a native. Um, so great for dry, hot, sandy areas, and they grow in that nice little clump. So they stay neat and have a, a different look than like a wild flower right. that spreads around, yes. Who hot, we wouldn't know anything about that today, would we? Right. <laughs> So I noticed, and that you've got kind of mulch everywhere, um, key to, I'm sure, to landscaping with Florida-friendly plants is mulching. Mm -hmm. What are we looking at? Um, we use a wide variety of mulches here in our demonstration gardens, and all of the mulches that we recommend are byproduct or recycled mulches. The pathway here, and we use for a lot of pathways, is Melaleuca mulch. And if you look at this, this is like a um, chip more of a chipped yeah, bark. Yeah, grind it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what the Melaleuca is. Mm -hmm. It makes now a great path. What's Melaleuca? Uh, Melaleuca, if you drive south into Florida, into the Everglades, you see a lot of white, papery barked trees that are very close together. They're very invasive um, in the Everglades, and um, they're removing those, composting them, and making them into mulch. So they're choking out yep. invasive. They're choking out the native trees Correct. that are... Right, okay. right. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's a good mulch for pathways. Um, over here we have pine bark, but also mixed with our um, oak leaves, our fallen oak leaves, so you can probably find... Um, oh, there's some burnt stuff there. That is is um, pine bark, so larger chunk, um, and then we've got our oak leaves. Mulch is kind of a personal preference as far as how you want it to look. Right. Um, but if you have an area where trees uh, lose their leaves and you're okay with leaving that as a mulch, that's perfectly acceptable and, you know, then you don't have to buy mulch or... Or rake leaves. Spread mulch or rake leaves, <laughs> right, exactly. So Very they all make good mulch. Now, why, why is it that mulch, why is mulch so important here in Florida? I mean, it's not just an aesthetic thing, is it? No, but it certainly does make everything look better mm -hmm. and ties everything together. Um, Again, two to three inches of mulch will help greatly suppress weeds. So if you start to notice a lot of weeds in your landscape, check your mulch. Um, if it starts to look sparse, that might be a key thing. Also with applying water, um, that mulch will help the soil moist under the, okay. under the um, mulch. Now with, with mulching, I know some people remulch every year. Some people do it, you know, biannually, whatever. Mm -hmm. What's a good rule of thumb, you know, as, as how do you check your mulch depth or when you need new mulch? Again, check for that, that two to three inches. Um, and in some places, if you have very large trees, you may end up accumulating way too much and actually have to remove some of those. So mm -hmm. if you have leaves accumulating to four to six inches, you could notice dieback of plants, fungal issues, those sorts of things. Okay. So th the correct amount of mulch will be reflected in your plant life around. It could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very cool. Well, let's move on. Whew, and it is one hot day in sunny Florida, isn't it? It sure is. <laughs> now, we've had the opportunity to go around your facility here and just kind of look at all the different plants, but there's some other things that I'd like to kind of cover. Having plants in Florida and making sure that they get the water. We talked about the irrigation and everything, but sometimes the plants need a little more nutrients because we've got this really sandy soil. Mm -hmm. When it comes to fertilizers, I mean, how do you know what to use, how much to use? How do you figure that stuff out? Um, well, following the right plant, right place principle, ideally you'd have a lot of plants or all of your plants that wouldn't need additional fertilization. Um, and certainly adding compost, organic matter to your sandy or poor soils every time you plant will be a big benefit, building that soil health. Much more natural rejuvenation right. and nutrients. Right, right. Um, and compost is a slow release fertilizer. If you buy a bag of fertilizer also, we recommend that it is a slow release product. Okay. Um, and then think about why you would apply a fertilizer anyway. You apply for growth or some sort of nutrient deficiency. So if you don't have those things or you don't want that growth, I wouldn't be applying a fertilizer. So, so if the plant looks healthy, 
Right. Then there's not really any need to do a ritual fertil fertilizing. Right. Yeah. Um, both with fertilizer. You know, some, some folks are like, oh, it's springtime. We got to fertilize everything. It's time to. Right. Right. Yeah. Or they have a monthly service that comes and really um, both fertilizers and pesticides should only be applied if, again, you have something you're trying to combat, either a nutrient deficiency or needing some growth on something. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings another interesting point, pesticides, because a lot of folks, they have, they have young kids, mm -hmm. um, they've got pets, they've got, and when you're building butterfly gardens and, and you know, planting Florida-friendly wildlife, that encourages Mm -hmm. Pests that mm -hmm. encourages bugs. Um, how do you how do you deal with uh, the pesticides? What kind of products are out there that are safe for people to use? Um, there are a lot of safe products, meaning um, they're approved by many of the organic associations, um, or they're things that are more natural. Although it is important to read a label of even a natural product because sometimes there are cautions that a, a natural product you still have to wear gloves or something right, like that. Right. Um, the first thing to do is identify what the pest is to determine if it is, is even a pest. Um, a lot of people don't know what a ladybug larvae looks like. And what a ladybug larvae looks like is a bad bug. Mm. It looks like a very small black alligator. <laughs> so identify I've what seen it those, is. And we've always yeah. wondered what in the world is that bug? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's a little baby. Yep. Yeah. And baby. you can call our office if you don't know what it is. You can bring it in. Identify it. Is it bad? Is it good? If it's bad, is it going to kill your plant? Just cause a small problem. Um, determine that. Um, and then also find out if there is some sort of predatory insect that would take care of it for you. So a common plant pest is aphids. Mm -hmm. Ladybugs eat aphids. Okay. So you can buy, buy ladybugs or they may naturally come and take care of it. And then kind of your last resort would be even a safe insecticide or pesticide, whatever it might be. Just read the label. Right. Read the label is important. Now, we live in a place that is full of lakes and streams and a lot of water runoffs. Um, you know, a lot of folks have waterfront property, and that brings about a whole nother scenario, not only of right plant, right place, but when it comes to fertilizing. Mm -hmm. If your property is right on a yard, I'd imagine that fertilizer is tr or uh, along a lake rather, mm -hmm. that fertilizer is going right down into the lake. Right. And it is important to remember that in Polk County, we do have a fertilizer ordinance that addresses both commercial applicators and homeowners. And if you're on a lake, you really need to know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, we encourage people around lakes, if you live on a lake or pond or have one in your neighborhood, um, to maintain a 10-foot area of native plantings around the perimeter. You're not going to get more alligators, you're not going to get more snakes than somebody that doesn't have that. Right. What you will get is a cleaner lakefront. Um, it'll stabilize your, your, your property there, so um, Keep it from you're me. not going to start losing it yeah. into the water. Um, and then you're filtering those pollutants before they get in the water. Very good, mm -hmm. very good. Well, this is all so very interesting. You know, I know when we had first talked, um, you know, the Florida-friendly landscape, I thought, well, you know, it's plants, mm -hmm. but there's so much more to it than just a plant. It's, it's knowing which plant is the right plant, mm -hmm. where to plant it, how to plant it, and how to take care of it. Right. Yeah, it certainly is all of those things combined. Again, all those nine principles working together um, in the process of designing your landscape, but then in maintenance as well. And I think it's really important for people to remember um, it's not how it looks, it's how it's maintained. Mm -hmm. oh, terrific. And thank you so much for mm -hmm. taking us around your place sure. here today and showing us everything there is to know about Florida-friendly landscaping. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> That's about all the time we've got for today. So join me next time as we seek out yet another science quest.